says author. Ah. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our WSJ Book Club discussion of the Maltese Falcon. Eric Larson, who picked this month's book, is here with us today. Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Jen. How are you? Great. Before we get started, now is the moment when we announce our April book pick. We'll be reading The Golden Bowl by Henry James. It was selected for us by our April guest host, Colm Tobin, author of Brooklyn and Nora Webster. Now we can get to the Maltese Falcon. Eric, you call this not only the ultimate detective novel, but one of the best novels, period. Why? Well, mainly because um, Hammett, in you know, a relatively few pages, as far as I'm concerned, created four of the most vivid and memorable and enduring characters of, uh, of 20th century American literature. And that's, that's no, uh, no small feat. Also, uh, because the approach that he takes, the narrative approach, the prose style that he, he deploys in this is, I think, I think very elegant, very spare, highly descriptive, and um, really an excellent way of conveying inner states without actually ever saying he felt, he saw, he, he, uh, he, he wondered, that kind of thing. A number of our readers asked questions about his descriptive techniques, so let's go through them one by one. James Cage says, oh, in, our, in a question that he posted on our Facebook page, he says, Eric, do you consider the author's style to be dated? What should a modern writer emulate about the Falcon, and what should he or she avoid? Do I consider it dated? Um, <laughs> I, I don't consider it dated, really. I actually think that there is, well, I have to qualify that. Like his descriptions of his uh, rolling a cigarette. Yeah, you know, maybe he could cut back like five words. You know, I mean, he could, he could do that. He could do that. Um, but I think that, that that is one of the aspects of Hammett's writing that is really very important to, to understand because that is how he conveys things without actually, you know, that's how he actually shows without telling, you know, the old saw. So I think uh, I think a lot of that detail is there for a very specific reason, and that is just to, to, to you know I, I think partly it's for pace, partly it's to really put you there in that scene and get a sense of of, of what Hammett is, what Sam Spade is all about. This is another question on the WSJ Facebook page. Alex Lewis says, as an as an author, what do you think about Hammett's descriptions of the settings for his scenes? I've heard that this is extraneous in modern fiction. Personally, I like it. Well, it may well be extraneous in modern fiction, but personally, I like it too. I like I like that sense of detail. Um, I like watching uh, Sam Spade roll his uh, his uh, his cigarette. Um, and again, I think it's I think it's very important because it conveys it conveys things beyond the actual detail. Here's a question and from Marian. I think that's the whole intent. Oh, sorry. Here's a question from Marian Anderferin. She says, speaking of descriptions, I'm struck by how much time Hammett spends describing characters' faces and facial reactions, like he's watching the scene but not in the scene. Also, action details, like Spade rolling a cigarette for the first time in the book. Seems like we don't have that kind of patience these days. Well, I think I think actually it depends a little bit on on who you're reading and and uh, and and what the, the, what a particular writer's approach is. Now, Hammett is it this it, it, this is his distinctive style. This is what he does. I'm not sure anybody needs to emulate it. I'm not sure there's any indication that really we're, we're less patient now to deal with it. I mean, I found myself reading uh, the Maltese Falcon for this book club. I think this is probably my tenth time I've read the book, and I. I felt fine with it, you know. I'm not. I'm not feeling impatient at all. I think again, it is a very effective way for Hammett to convey states of mind without actually um, committing the sin of of saying he felt, he saw, etc. James Cage had a follow up on that. He said, um, speaking about the description of the characters, he said modern authors seldom describe characters with this level of detail. Hammett also repeated descriptive details both about the characters and. Uh, the scenes. He says, is this distracting or does it add something to the story? Well, uh, I, I can only respond uh, from my reaction. Uh, my reaction is, no, it's not, it's not distracting. Although, possibly for a modern reader, I suppose, I, I, uh, it, 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 I suppose it could be because he really does go into quite a bit of detail. But again, that's, that's what he's, he's about. Mm -hmm. 
Let's talk more about the characters. You have described them as four of the most memorable characters in literature. Why do you say that? And how, how did Hammett create them um, to be so special and so memorable? Well, you know, I, I, I think they're so special and memorable because, well, first of all, Sam Spade. I mean, look, Sam Spade has become you know, the quintessential hard-boiled detective. He's the icon of that, of that whole genre. And so anybody who can create an icon um, right there is, is, is quite a talent. But not only did he create one absolutely vivid character who has endured um, throughout, throughout the, the decades, um, he also created uh, Casper Gutman, the fat man, you know, who has, who in his own way is also something of, 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 a, uh, of an icon, an indelible character, mimicked and mocked in, in, in comedies. Um, I think every writer who writes a detective story would love to have a fat man equivalent, but it's been done, and it's been done too well. And then there's Joel Cairo. I mean, nobody's, nobody's going to gonna equal him as well. Um, uh, my, the, the fourth character... Bridget O'Shaughnessy, I think, is um, I think is absolutely a fantastic character in the book. Um, I don't think so so much in the movie. Um, so another one of our readers, Chongo Horatio Kelly, uh, in a post on the WSJ Book Club Facebook page, um, says there was quite a bit of discussion about the book's antiquated views, particularly regarding women. Good discussion, I thought. However, I think the book has a contemporary element, too. I'm thinking of the deception and cynicism of the characters. No Dudley Do-Rights or Polly Purebreds in this story, not even Nick and Nora Charles. What do you think? No, I agree. I agree that there are, there are no, uh, no plain vanilla moral characters, you know, um, and I think that's really what makes this book also very appealing. Everybody's lying his ass off. Um, I think that uh, I think that um, I think it, it's a wonderful study in the various levels and modes of, of, uh, of, of interpersonal corruption, which I like. Um, uh, the archaic aspects, attitudes toward women, um, attitudes towards Joe Cairo as clearly a homosexual character. You know, uh, things have changed. Our attitudes have changed, but we sort of have to accept that in Hammett's time, this is how he wrote it, and this is what was like for him, at least in his eyes. We had a really interesting discussion on that subject on our WSJ Facebook page. Um, and readers sort of came down on two, in two different camps, I think. Some of our Facebook um, book club members said that it was a reflection of the times. And others said, well, Hammett was doing something specific to show us about Spade's character that there was more than just a reflection of sort of pervasive sexism, but that he was trying to tell us something about who Spade is. What do you think? Well, I mean, he's always trying to tell you something about the characters. I mean, he doesn't waste, he does not waste words. The question is how he goes about telling you something about the characters. Now, do we read, do we read his, his, his tendency toward, toward sexism as, as simply a, a kind of a, a organic to Sam Spade? Or is it something that is more organic to, to the era? Now, interesting, there are some little riffs on that. Like, for example, at one point, Sam Spade makes breakfast for, for, for her, and at another point, she makes breakfast for him. So that was kind of, I found that kind of, kind of, kind of interesting. But, but, you know, first and foremost, uh, Hammett is trying to tell us something about the characters, um, and, and whether he does so in a manner we today would find appropriate, I, I think is relevant. I think it's not, it's not, appropriate to judge a past work by modern standards. Otherwise, we'd have to really take a hard look at Gone with the Wind, and Huck Finn, and any number of, of, uh, of uh, you know, early, early works. Uh, another one of our readers, Kevin Komaski, posted this question on the WSJ Book Club Facebook page. How does Hammett make us like speed? Is he, is, sorry, is it how he takes charge and controls events? When I read this years ago, I liked Spade. Now, on closer reading, he's reprehensible. <laughs> I don't find him reprehensible at all. I think that I think that Spade. I think what makes him an appealing character, at least to some of us, is he's sort of the. As a guy, I'm speaking now as a guy. I can't I can't speak for how I would read it if I were if I were a woman. But I'm speaking as a guy now. That there is something. Something about Spade that resonates, I think, with with 
all of us, or at least at least with me, this, this sort of sense of being comfortable in in the world in a way that I mean, certainly I don't I don't feel all the time. But Spade, you know, he seems to be the kind of guy who'd be absolutely comfortable in any situation, sort of the height of of of, of cool, you know, for that for that time. A guy with a a strong uh, strong inner compass. Whether you totally agree with what that compass direction can do, it's you know I don't know, but but he's got a strong inner compass, and that's very, that's very. It really has a resonance, at least for me as a as a as a man. And actually, I think it's also important to go back to with this book to the time when you first read it. You know, I I I wish that we could go back to our favorite books with the same outlook we had. Uh, same everything the first time we actually read it because because it'd be so nice to come afresh to all of our favorite books but we'd have to probably be amnesiacs to do it but the first time I read um, the Maltese Falcon was in San Francisco I had just been transferred there and uh, you know San Francisco uh, is of course the setting for the Maltese Falcon and believe me walking around San Francisco you feel still even to this day you can feel what comes through in the Maltese Falcon, and and for me, it made the reading of that book a very, very vivid experience, and it made Sam Spade and his, and his his cool and his way of moving through the world just seem all the more appealing. And we should share for our viewers that you once had his final speech memorized. I Can you talk about why you love that speech so much? Oh, because. Because it's so, in a way, it's so unexpected how he that he's gonna that, that he's gonna do this. He's gonna send Bridget O'Shaughnessy to the dogs, you know. And it's like any other book, maybe from that era, would probably would probably have a, a different a different ending. But the thing about it was that again, it comes back to this this assurance and this sense of cool and and this 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 inner compass even though clearly he he's well whether he's in love or not he's certainly deeply attracted but he, he's clearly in love with Bridget O'Shaughnessy or at least there's the potential for him to be in love with Bridget O'Shaughnessy but he's not going to let that get in the way he's not going to let that get in the way in, in his own sort of sort of deeply rooted sense of honor what a man's got to do so you know it's and, and that, that that part of the monologue where he says to her says to her you know it's it's this it's this and this and then and then and then, and then it's this and you know it's just it's just really I, I, I think it resonates a lot with it certainly with guys I'd be curious to know if women feel that way but I don't know well it doesn't resonate with the character Effie it doesn't resonate with the character Effie. No, she's the conscience of the book. I'm telling you, she's she's the she's the conscience. But it also shows that I think that she's she's there also to show that uh, Bridget O'Shaughnessy is such a deft liar that she even put one over on on, on Effie. You know, Effie thought she was a good person, and uh, I think Effie was wrong. I think I think Bridget O'Shaughnessy probably you know if, if you had a if you had a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist, read them all this back, and I, I'm just about certain he would come up with the idea. That uh, Bridget O'Shaughnessy was a, in fact, a, a sociopath. So, tell me about your favorite, um, your favorite characters in the movie, and what you felt worked in the movie, and what didn't work in the movie. I think the movie worked on every single level imaginable. <laughs> Except, except for the Bridget O'Shaughnessy character, I would have chosen a different actress. I don't know who I would have chosen. I did not like her as the character. I did not see her as as the character, the actress. And I can't even remember what, what her name was. But, but the movie to me worked um, absolutely beautifully. Uh, a because the characters, uh, the actors chosen, really I think were perfect. Except again for Bridget O'Shaughnessy. I mean. The guy who, you know, Humphrey Bogart, of course, playing Sam Spade, might like, not define the role, and almost makes it difficult to read the book a second, third, fourth time because once you've seen the film, you know, you see, you, you can't help but picture Bogart. But also Sidney Greenstreet, my lord, as as Casper Gutman, perfect, perfect, and Joel, you know, uh, uh, Peter Lorre as Joel Cairo, also absolutely perfect, and even the guy who plays Wilmer, you know, the 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 the, the two bit thug. I mean, everybody's really terrific. But what I think really makes the movie is that the, the uh, John Houston had the good sense 
to lift actual dialogue and, and actual passages from from the book itself. I mean, there are there are portions of the dialogue in the movie that are word for word from from the book. I just think it works on on so many levels. And plus, plus, you know, it, it's it's again, it's it's set in, in in well, what appears to be San Francisco. There's this nice sort of moody feel to the whole film. Um, one little kitschy thing that I think could have done without is that at the very end, as the Bridget O'Shaughnessy character, he's already s turned her over to the to the cops and stuff. The, <laughs> if I recall correctly, she goes down in an elevator, and the elevator is one of those barred elevators, and it's sort of the slow descent, and that's that's a little over the top, but it worked back then. Who would you cast today as Bridget O'Shaughnessy if you were casting it? Emma Stone. Yeah. Emma Stone. I, I would cast Emma Stone. I think she'd be great. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think, I think Emma Stone. We have a question just in from a reader, James Cage. He says, many people know something about Sam Spade and the Maltese Falcon from pop culture. What about the book do you think would surprise people who only know the Falcon from movie imitations and parodies? I think, hmm, that's a very good question. What would surprise, what would surprise readers? I think, for one thing, the attention to detail would, would surprise would surprise readers. Um, and I think actually the the the, the uh, multi layers of uh, corrupt behavior um, might also might also surprise uh, somebody who had only been familiar from. From popular culture, um, you know, obviously, obviously, over time, Sam Spade has become not just an icon, but he's become sort of, a, uh, you know, I, I, as I said before, some, somebody who is routinely mocked um, in in the, you know in spoofs and so forth, um, kind of very much the way the Bogart character in um, in Casablanca is also you know, riffed and mocked and so forth. Um, and that's, it's kind of unfortunate because hey, I, I wish we could go back to, to that era, to the point of view of that era, when the book was brand new, and read it and see what people at the time saw about Sam Spade that made him become this icon. I mean, we're, we're all, even those who come to the book fresh today, we're still, we still have a cultural sense of what Sam Spade is and what Humphrey Bogart is and all this stuff. But I wish we could all go back and have read, had read this, you know, uh, the day it came out, way back when, and see what it was about Sam Spade even then that made him really work, and about the other characters as well. Our reader, J.M., posted this comment on the Google Hangout page. He said he's interested in the Flitcraft parable, and I know this interests you too, so could you first, for readers who may not be familiar with it, sort of summarize it for us and then talk about what you find interesting about it? Flitcraft parable is a is a is a very odd uh, a very odd passage in the book. It it it, it is where um, uh, where Sam Spade and Bridget are talking, and Sam Spade just suddenly launches into a story about this guy Flitcraft who had um, been walking along and something uh, fell uh, on the sidewalk right in front of him or back of him. I can't remember. Um, and just about killing him, and it, and it caused a dramatic change in him. He left his family, he went elsewhere, set up a whole new life, and, um, and then instead of his life being different than it was back originally, it actually turns out to be the same life only in a different place. And he tells this story to Bridget. It's clear that Bridget has zero interest. It's clear that she has no interest. Like her, her next remark is like, okay, but, you know. Um, and I, I, I'm perplexed about the thing, too. Um, Part of me wonders if if it if it if it might not have been almost um, almost filler, almost a, a, a almost a thing that maybe the editor his editor wanted. I don't know. Uh, it 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 is one of those things in the book that actually I think the book would have been just fine without. So I'm 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 a little bit mystified about how and why it went in there. Well, another one of our readers asked a related question. Um, this is another one from James Cage, who is a super book club member for all the questions that he's submitting. Um, he mentions the Flitcraft episode, um, and also 
he mentions the a dream sequence in um, one of the Continental Op books, and he says, "Do you feel that elements of the Falcon were intentionally symbolic? And if so, which elements?" Do I feel elements of the Falcon were symbolic? Um, no. <laughs> I don't really see. I don't really read a lot of uh, sim symbolism into the Falcon. I think the Falcon. The Falcon was the thing that sort of held the, you know, the, the, the object of the, the quest. Um, from a strictly a narrative engineering point of view, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's the thing that everybody wants. It's the thing that everybody wants, and then how, how brilliant uh, that in the end, um, uh, the thing that everybody wants and they think they have is a fake. You know, it just sort of is the, sort of, in that sense, maybe it is symbolic. It's sort of a metaphor for the corruption that goes on elsewhere in the book. Even the falcon itself, this coveted object, turns out to be a fake. We had a lively discussion about Sam Spade's moral code, the, the detective's code by which he operates, which he doesn't reveal until the end. And um, as a special treat, you wrote us an alternative ending to the Maltese Falcon. Um, and, and I want to read it out loud because it was such a, a treat to read. So the, the scenario was what would happen if the Maltese Falcon did turn out to be real, and what would Sam Spade do? And, and here's the ending that you wrote. I'm not sure it would have changed much with regard to Spade. He seemed content to take the finder's fee well before the thing was discovered to be a fake. As to Bridget and the rest, here's how I'd play it. Bridget pulls a gun on Spade, Cairo, Gutman, and Wilmer. Gutman tries his usual pattern to get her to put it down. She shoots Gutman, then Cairo. Wilmer bolts. Now, facing Spade, it's her turn to deliver a monologue. She tells Spade she really does love him and wishes he had never found the Falcon, and then shoots him too. And she tells him, as he looks at her over a thin and cynical smile, that she'll have a few sleepless nights, but the Falcon will more than make up for it. Then she shoots him again. <laughs> so can you talk to us a little bit about um, how this moral code sort of plays out at the end and what decisions they're, you know, what are the basis for these decisions? Is it money? Is it, is it sex? Is it um, honor? And, and what are the hierarchy of those? If there's more money at stake, do things play out differently? I think, I think with, regard to, with regard to Sam Spade, I think that um, it's not about money. I don't think any amount of money would have shaken his... Um, would have shaken his end, end resolve to, to, to do the right thing in terms of Miles, his dead partner, um, uh, and to, in fact, send Bridget to the to, to, to jail. I think that's the essential element of his, and, and, and calling it a moral code is, is a tricky thing. I really prefer calling it his interior compass because it may be that there isn't that much moral about his code but he's got a code he's got a code and that is to to look out for you know your, your, your partner to, to avenge his death even though you didn't like the partner and in you the were end having an affair with his wife what? excuse me and you were having an affair with his wife and yes having an affair <laughs> having an affair with his wife see that's not necessarily moral and yet when you distill everything he does what appears to be the, the right thing by this interior compass of his. And I think he would do it no matter how much money was at stake. And I think that, uh, and I think that he would send Bridget down even if there, were, uh, if there were an alternative path. I mean, he could just as easily have let her go, you know, but, um, but he did not. How does Hammett build suspense? Hammett builds suspend because we have we know that this thing the Falcon exists we are told it exists early on um, and and it is the thing that is held out in front of us throughout the book and that's that's a key element of suspense this this thing that you want to know about you want them to find because you want to know what it really is and there are various teases along the way for example when uh, when uh, um, History professor talks about what it is, and, and what when when uh, when Casper Gutman talks about it in such elaborate terms with that classic Gutman pattern of his. So there's that. So there, there's that element. 
but also from the very beginning. I mean, first of all, you have this this, this woman come in with this story, and, and again, that in itself, this the opening scene, um, really was sort of the iconic, hard-boiled detective. Scene, it all began, you know. Um, and so she comes in with a story, and then the next thing you know, Miles Archer is is dead, and that's uh, that's a very important element of suspense, also because it's like, well, what the heck? What happened there? Who who did in Miles Archer, and is there more to the story? So right away, you're hooked and you're on your way. And he 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 riffs on all those things, like who killed whom. Suddenly there's a, suddenly there's a visit from this exotic character, Joel Cairo. And then he's being followed by Wilmer. All this adds to the suspense. All this, this idea of well, what is actually going on. And then when, when Casper Gutman finally enters the picture, you get a certain amount of, of, of reveal, only to be cast off again on this path because now you know more about the Falcon. You know what its, what its value is alleged to be. And that, that becomes the primary engine of, of suspense. And of course, then the question is, well, what is... What is uh, Sam Spade going to do about about Bridget? And that's the final element. You know, is he going to? Are they going to fall in love and live happily ever after and have corrupt children, or you know, are they going to go on and uh, and you know have have uh, you know? Is this the the only ending possible? Do they send her down to jail? Here's a new question: What is your opinion of Joe Gore's prequel to the Maltese Falcon, Spade and Archer? Yeah, you know, I did not read uh, Joe Gore's prequel, *Spade and Arch*, but I did read his book *Hammett*, which I quite, quite, quite liked. It was a, it was an interesting, interesting way of, of looking at uh, *Hammett*. See, see, once upon a time, I actually did a very detailed story, uh, article about um, about *Hammett*, um, framed by actually a, a, a National *Hammett* tour in San Francisco that I took, and it was really fun, really interesting, going to all the places that I mentioned. In and that gave me a framework to sort of read deeply into Hammett, read all his, all his short stories, which, believe me, if you want to talk about sexism. Really? Are they worse? Read some of them. Some of them were really quite, quite amazing and nice stories. So, so uh, but reading into, into Hammett's past and reading uh, Reading all of, all of his, I read all of his short stories, everything that Hammett ever wrote, including his awful final attempt at a novel, which happily died before he tried to publish it. But um, it's just just a, a fascinating, fascinating character. And his, you know, his Thin Man books, I just think are fabulous as well. Tell us about Hammett. What are some things that you find interesting about him? Well, one of the things I find interesting is his relationship um, with Lillian Helm. Um, after he divorced his wife Josie, who was in the dedication uh, of uh, Maltes Falcon, um, he hooked up with uh, Lillian Helm, and they never married, but they had a very long-term relationship. Um, and there's always been a question, and it depends on whose side of the relationship you, you want to stand. There's always been a, a question of whether whether Hammett wrote some of her things, which is why they were so good, or whether she wrote some of his things, which is why they're so good. So it's a very interesting relationship. Now I come down though with the, my my view of that relationship was is that in the end it was destructive to Hammett's talents. Um, and you know, this is my theory alone. So if anybody wants to crucify me, please just crucify me, nobody else. But it is my my theory that that because Lillian Hellman tended to view the, his, his, his writing, his work, as not terribly serious, not terribly literary, certainly not on the level of you know, her own literary achievements. But I think in the end it became somewhat destructive to him. And I think that's why, that's why his, his, his writing, um, that, that last project, really began to, really began to change. Um, but anyway, that's just, just one man's theory. I'd love to have gone back, though, and, and have kind of, kind of sat in on some of their conversations, the two of them, Lillian and, and Hammett, and just kind of, kind of, kind of get a flavor for what their lives were like. You know, there was a there was a film, Julia, um, which had some of the fictional view, cinematic view of their relationship. I think Jason Robards played Hammett. 
I was very interested in that relationship, but also by the fact that, that Hammett was, in fact, at one point, um, an actual, he was a private detective. Uh, he uh, was a private detective for a number of years, but then he left uh, apparently because he got, uh, he got fed up with how uh, he was being used to investigate um, uh, uh, and sort of combat uh, labor unions. And in fact, and, and I, I believe he worked for Pinkerton um, uh, until he until his resignation. Here's a new question from Mark W. on our Google Hangout page. He says, how do you feel about Spade's inherent modesty? Here's in the way a new question from Mark W. About, about Spade's inherent comment of the boomer and his weapons. And his weapons. A block of news. A block of news. I, I missed part of that question. Can you repeat it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm, having, I'm having technical issues. How do you feel, do you feel about the modesty that plays, plays out with regard to, with regard to men about Wilmer and his, his weapons? Well, took him off a blind newsie. Took him off a blind newsie. Oh, all right. So, so. Well, what I got from that question was, but what? Uh, how, how do I feel about Spade and and uh, I thought I heard the word modesty, but I wasn't sure. Uh, Spade and um, and and Wilmer and taking the guns off him. I think I think that that that, that scene where where he he, uh, he disarms uh, Wilmer, I think is a very very important scene because it speaks to Spade's again to this sort of otherworldly competence and capability for him to be able to. Here's this. This this thug who has obviously killed people in the past. Um, he's uh, he, he's got got a couple of guns. He's certainly willing in the book to use them. Uh, and here's Spade, unfazed, you know, takes him takes him off the kid and uh, and, and, and so, um, quite happy with the fact that he was able to do it. Although he, then, then he does make that remark about the blind news, um, which is kind of interesting in itself. But I think it cuts. I think the scene cuts to again to his to his overall um, otherworldly sort of competence. The thing that I think uh, really appeals to, at least to people like like me. Here's another question. Here's another question. Uh, uh, the new, the new, the new Falcon, Falcon movie. movie. How about a Falcon? A Falcon. 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 Uh, so uh, uh, how about a Falcon? Maltese Falcon stage play. You know, I would rather, I would much prefer that to to seeing anybody try to actually do a do a film, because um, I mean, a play would be really a lot of fun. I, I'm not sure I'd want to see a, I'm not sure I'd want to see a musical, um, but I think a play could be actually a, a, a lot of fun. You'd have to, you could actually reduce it to just um, just uh, uh, five uh, five characters. You know. The, the, uh, you know, Spade, Gutman, Cairo, Bridget, and Wilmer, you know, and they could all, that, that could be it. I mean, it would really be a lot of fun. But you'd still have to deal with the fact that, uh, you know, uh, John Huston did it best, probably. Maybe it should never be done again, stage or film. Maybe you need to get, you, yeah. you know, playwriting business. I may, in fact, write a play. I'd rather write a play, uh, I'd rather take on a play than take on a novel, frankly. You know? and, but uh, in fact, I'd like to try to do a play about, you know, maybe one of my own books. Do it, reduce it to two characters. Is that something that you like about? Is that something that you like about? Is that it's limited cast of characters. Characters. I do like the fact that it's a limited cast of characters, but it's not so limited that 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 you feel claustrophobic or that it's restricted. Uh, I, I think there's really a sense of, through these characters of, of far, far from uh, limitation. You really get a sense of an outside world much bigger than the story at hand. With the, the allusions to the Russian and uh, you know, whatever his name was. The, the allusions to the Russian and the overall sense of, of exotic things happening in parts and places. I think that's very. Um, I think that's. I think it's all very, very compelling. Um, so. What else do you want our readers to know? What else do I want the readers to know? I don't know. I mean, I think I think the key thing is to just really, you know, read the Maltese Falcon for 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 what it is, and just let it let it do you, and try to imagine, 
try to imagine these characters in old San Francisco and just kind of kind of view it. Let let the book just sort of wash over you as it was intended to do. And then, you know, if, especially if you're a writer, go back and take a look at how he actually does some of what he does. There is no point in the book where you are left wondering what Sam Spade is actually thinking. There is no point where that happens. And yet, Hammett never says Spade thought or Spade felt. It's it all conveyed by this exterior sense of, of, of detail and, and description. And I think that's a very powerful thing for any writer to, to learn, not necessarily to mimic, but to just take, take a close look at that and see how he does it. It's sort of like you know, Hammett was really in the same school, uh, if you will, as um, as uh, Fitzgerald and, and Hemingway. They all sort of share um, similar kind of connections in terms of how they how they used prose and how they conveyed images. And in fact, Hammett and Fitzgerald were uh, were, were friends. Um, uh, Fitzgerald was, uh, in, in the eyes of some literary scholars, is considered to be of the sort of hard-boiled school, and, and even with his book Gatsby. Um, so I think there's a lot to learn from Hammond about characters, about describing characters, about creating characters who can really jump off the page. But again, I come back to always, above all, this, this ability to, 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 to give us entree to interior states of mind purely by exterior description and motion. You talked about how talk the moon in the kitchen. Talk about talk about in the book. Do you feel do you feel that there's that something there's important something he's trying to tell us? And if so, what is he trying to tell us at Effie's reaction at the end? Something that uh, important that Hammond is trying to convey through the Maltese Falcon. Um, I don't know that he's really trying to convey much more than the story at hand, to be honest. Um, I, I think that, um, I, I, or maybe this is just me being wishful on the subject. I mean, I think that I think that Hammett, um, I think the Maltese Falcon is 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 a great story, and Hammett is telling it because it's a great story. Now, people can read. I, I tend to be of that. That I tend to I tend to come to uh, works of literature with sort of a, a, a willful naivete, if you, if, you, if you will. I try to read them on, as, as I, I imagine they were meant to be read, you know, not with, a, you know, not with, a, uh, not with your computer at hand with you know, Googling lit crit approaches to, to Hammett or to whatever. I tend to just sort of let books do me and not worry about the symbolism and, and so forth. And if there is something that jumps out of me, fine, I accept that. That's great. It's very how clever, you know. But it's the story that that that, that I'm after, and that, that I think that's what Hammett was after with this. It's just a fantastic story, with fantastic characters, and I think it really works, and I think it still works. You know. Thanks so much. Thanks for so joining. much for joining. Thank you very much. It's been great fun. And to all those who participated, it's terrific. Read on. Bye. Bye. Bye.